Hey, welcome to another Bio 100. Today we're going to continue on with this idea of carbon cycling in our atmosphere uh, and in our biological world, and we're going to talk just a little bit more uh, about how both plants and animals do this in the form of respiration and photosynthesis. So we're going to start off with this experiment right here. I'm going to go ahead and close my video. You don't need me for this. And uh, we're going to ask the question, we're going to form a hypothesis actually from this. Okay, so these are radish seeds, and we've set them in three different petri dishes. They all weigh exactly the same, 1.5 grams of radish seeds in each one of these petri dishes. But this set of radish seeds was exposed to light and no water, this set to light and water, and this set to dark and water. And then one week later, all the plant material that resulted from these experiments was dried in an oven so that no water remained and weighed. And what this leaves us with is what we call plant biomass, right? This is the remainder of the structural material from, um, from the different experiments of these seeds. So we weighed how much each one of these plants weighed after they had been exposed to each one of these treatments uh, after a week. So what I want you to do is I want you to sit back and make a hypothesis. <clears throat> Which one of these um, changed in weight, decreased in weight, stayed the same? Um, did multiple stay the same? Did multiple decrease in weight? That kind of thing. I want you to make a hypothesis about what each one of these treatments resulted in uh, in terms of plant biomass. So go ahead and hit the pause button and think that up. Okay. So we're looking at this, right? So here's our treatments that we just went over. Here's the initial biomass. Everything was at 1.5 grams. And then here's the final biomass. So you need to think, what was the, so like in here is where we're gonna put the final biomass. So think about your hypothesis and think about what you'd expect. And I'm gonna put the answers up here. Okay, so here it is. So here's light and no water. So it's actually a little bit less than 1.5 grams, so about the same as what we'll say. It, it may have lost some because seeds retain a little bit of moisture to keep um, the nutrients inside viable, so that little bit of moisture is probably lost. And then if you're over, looking over here, we have light and water. So this is at 1.83 grams, so these have grown, okay, uh, and then increased in weight, and then this is actually decreased in weight, no light and no water. So can you think of a reason for these numbers? Think about it. Go ahead and hit the pause button and think about it. Okay, let's move forward. So hopefully you've actually thought about it. So right now, you could, if you've drawn this out on a piece of paper, you could write in what happened in each one of these. So think specifically in terms of photosynthesis and respiration. So with no light and no water, was this plant able to do photosynthesis? With light and water, was this plant able to do photosynthesis and respiration? And then in dark and water, was this plant able to do both photosynthesis and respiration? Okay. And wait, what? We didn't get your answer? So you guys, um, you should probably think really, really hard about this, okay? And figure out which one did respiration and photosynthesis, which one did only one of those, which one did none of those. So go ahead and hit pause and think that through. Okay, so if we're thinking about it, if there's no water and no light, can plants grow? So if there's no growth, there's no respiration. And in plants, generally growth includes um, photosynthesis. So then here, when you're looking at light and water, so these can grow because of the water and they can grow because they have photosynthesis. Okay, so that makes sense. But one thing I want to point out here is if you're looking at this, is there soil here? Where are the plants getting, getting the things that make them grow? Because they're not pulling it out of the soil. So where is it coming from? Where, is, where are the molecules and nutrients and things coming from that are making them grow? And then here, these individuals have water so they can sprout, but they're in the dark, so they can't do photosynthesis, so they actually lost the most weight. So what might be happening there? 
So you know they're not doing photosynthesis, so they can't grow large, larger. But why would they lose weight? Think about that for a minute. So it has to do with respiration. So it turns out that respiration is when plants lose CO2, uh, lose oxygen and other things, sorry, not CO2, they lose oxygen and other things to the environment. And so they actually will, will lose weight, essentially, if they can't do photosynthesis. So hang in there, we'll talk about this. All right, so <clears throat> cellular respiration has to do with food energy, and it's stored as ATP in both plants and animals. And ATP is really just a triphosphate, is all it is. And here's you have these three negatively charged phosphates, okay? And if you get if you get rid of one of these, it turns into ADP, which would be diphosphate. So you have diphosphates and triphosphates, and that's what we're showing here. So here you have your triphosphate. Let's say that this ATP gives energy in terms of an electron here to. <coughs> um, to the enzyme, the enzyme's able to do whatever it needed to do, okay, and that results in ADP. So, and the energy from ATP can be used to power just about all sorts of functions in your body, okay, uh, and in, in the animal world as well. So here's mechanical work, so this is a bacterium and it has these little flagella on the end, and those flagella are literally spun like little motors, and it's ATP that makes them spin. Um, we've also got transport work. This is moving things against concentration gradients. Uh, a lot of what goes between, uh, passes through the cell membrane can be done passively, but there are times when you need to move something against a concentration, and that will require energy, and ATP is what provides that energy. And here you've got uh, chemical work, which is kind of what we just showed in the previous slide, where ATP will provide the energy for an enzyme to make a product. <clears throat> so um, as ATP is used up, it's the cellular respiration that replenishes it. Uh, and food is the one, food energy is what provides the phosphates to keep uh, ADP turning into ATP. And it uses oxygen, so it's an aerobic exercise. And these, this reaction actually takes place in the cytosol, if you remember where that is, and the mitochondria. I'm sure everyone remembers that. Um, and it occurs in three steps. We have glycolysis, the citric, the citric acid cycle, and oxidation. And so what I want you to do is sketch this out on a piece of paper right now. And I want you to answer these questions. So what organelle is this? Um, name the process in each one of these boxes, the starting reactants, and the end product. So go ahead and take a pause and see if you can work that out on your own. All right, so if you aren't able to work that out, and hopefully you did actually hit the pause button and try, if you aren't able to work that out, we got work to do, but we can do it. We're gonna keep this pretty simple. Um, these are all portions of what goes on during cellular respiration, and you should be familiar with each one of these, okay? Um, and I'm not expecting you to know them in depth and the chemistry and all that kind of stuff, but you need to know what's going on. All right, so here's the basic run through, and there's a YouTube video that you can watch here uh, in your own time, highly encourage you to do it. It's always good to hear it from somebody else in a different way with a little bit of animation. But essentially what we have is glycolysis. So glycolysis is when you're, you're gonna take a glucose molecule and it's gonna be turned into a pyruvate. And this is gonna result, just this reaction alone is gonna result in two ATPs. But you're gonna consume two ATPs, pushing the pyruvate into the mitochondrion and into the subsequent citric acid cycle. So the citric acid cycle We'll go in here, there'll, there'll be like some really cool things that'll happen, and you're gonna get two ATPs out of this with some CO2 as well. Uh, and then you're gonna have oxidation happen. And the oxidation is gonna result in about 34 ATPs plus water. Okay, so a more in-depth portion of what's gonna happen here. So you're gonna have an electron transport um, and ATP synthesis. So the electron transport chains they really act like a conveyor belt. They're moving electrons uh, through a series of proteins shown here, okay, and it's NADH is the molecule. NADH is gonna generate an electron into these proteins, and as those electrons move through those proteins, they're actually gonna be moving hydrogens out here into the inner membrane space. And what happens is these, hydrons, these, hydrogen, uh, these hydrogens build up 
out here into a really high concentration. And so um, they need to move back through. Okay, so you get this concentration of hydrogen ions, they increase in the inner, in the inner membrane space, and then um, they're charged, so they can't simply just pass through the membrane. Uh, they have to pass through a protein channel, and this protein channel is called ATP synthase, and it's made for generating ATPs. So as these hydrogen ions pass through, you get ADP that is turned into ATP, and the, uh, outpu the output here is water, right? Because oxygen captures the hydrogen ions, uh, sorry, the electrons that pass through the proteins to push the hydrogens through. Hopefully that all makes sense. Watch some of these videos. Um, they will, they'll be able to, to, uh, to show you how to do this as well and to give you another perspective on top of what I've explained. So proteins and fats can also provide energy when there aren't carbohydrates together, right? So your mitochondria, they run on carbohydrates. Your body needs carbohydrates to function. So I know that there's you know, been a lot of uh, dieting and things like that and keeping low carbs, and it is important to not eat too many carbs, but carbs are important for body function. Um, so the carbs are broken down, uh, and so are fats and proteins, okay? That they're broken down in the pathway, uh, and then they are turned in, they're pushed right on into the mitochondrion and you can do uh, respiration that way as well. Now, it can, you can have the anaerobic respiration, but this is gonna result in, um, in, in lactic acid, basically. So energy can be made without oxygen, but not only does it result in lactic acid, the result in ATP is much, much less. So an anaerobic, uh, cellular respiration that's done anaerobically results in two ATPs, whereas when it's done with oxygen, you have 34, and here's kind of how this works, right? Glucose, pyruvate, lactate. Okay, so you're, you're actually getting fermentation here to create this, and you get these lactic acid buildups, right, in your muscles. When you're working out really, really hard and you become really sore afterward, um, that's the buildup of lactate, right, that you're, of lactic acid, that you're essentially doing cellular respiration uh, without oxygen because you can't push oxygen to the cells in the way that you'd like, in the way that your body would prefer. Um, and, uh, and this is kind of talking about this lactic acid that builds up there. Um, but bacteria can also do respiration anaerobically. Um, in yeast cells, they use fermentation to convert glucose into ethanol. So you have these different ways that respiration is done. All right, so back to regular cellular respiration. You just need to have a little bit of an idea of each one of these are, the cell, right, cellular respiration, ADP, ATP, cytoplasma, electron transport chain. You just need to know how all of these kind of set up and work, and, uh, and you, should, you should have it. All right, so photosynthesis, kind of the same level of detail is what we're gonna expect. So there are some bacteria that do, photo, that do photosynthesis, um, but no animals and no fungi do it. Um, and it's really just this, just this uh, process where carbon dioxide is combined with water and light energy plays a huge part of this, and you're gonna produce glucose and oxygen. So this is why plants are so good. They produce the oxygen that we breathe, the glucose that we consume that runs our cellular respiration. Um, and then, uh, so carbon dioxide is gonna enter the plant through stomata, and I'll show you a picture of stomata in a little bit, but essentially uh, stomata are just openings on the underside of the leaf, and they bring in the carbon dioxide. Now, this is really, really key and you need to remember this, okay? Plants do not get their biomass, their size, their growth from the soil. They pull it from the atmosphere. They pull CO2 from the atmosphere, and this is what they use to grow, okay? That's really important to remember. Um, but just putting it really, really simply, light plus water plus carbon dioxide uh, in plants, plants grow and get, grow from that, and then they get oxygen. The output is oxygen and sugar. Now, before I move on, I just want to emphasize, right, plants do not grow from what they pull from the soil, um, but they do get water from the soil, they get micronutrients, macronutrients, that type of stuff from the soil, but the growth comes uh, from the carbon dioxide. I know I'm belaboring this, you're probably going to be grateful I did. Okay, so photosynthesis. It occurs in organelles that are called chloroplasts, and there's some different parts to these, okay? You have the stroma, 
which is really this thick fluid here um, inside the chloroplast. And then you have the thylakoids. These are going to be these disc-like membrane structures. And these, essentially what they do is they, they're covered, uh, they, they give the chloroplast more surface area because you have lots of them stacked on top of each other, uh, which just provides more surface area. And the, each one of these thy thylakoids are actually covered in chlorophyll, which are the pigment molecules. And you can see it a little bit better here. Here are the chlorophyll co covering each one of the thylakoids. And then here's the stroma a little bit for orientation. So photosynthesis takes place in two steps. Okay, we're going to keep this as simple as, as we can. So there's the light reaction that takes place in the thylakoids, again here. And there's the dark reaction, or the Calvin cycle. I just prefer to have light and dark reaction. It's easier to remember. And that's going to take, pay, take place in the stroma. All right, so the light, the light reaction uh, is really just light energy that gets absorbed by the chlorophyll. Now remember, the chlorophyll are covered here. Um, and this excites chlorophyll electrons. Does this sound familiar? Uh, water is going to be split to give off oxygen and convert NADP plus into NADPH, OK? So we have water that gets split, and it's, and it's giving off its electrons. They're, they're moving through an electron transport chain, OK? And then those electrons go on to make NADPH. And then you have these hydrogen ions coming through making ATP. So kind of similar to what we just saw in, um, in cellular respiration. So the electron, I'll, I'll review again, right? The electrons are going to move down an electron transport chain, producing ATP. The NADPH is going to ferry its electrons to the stroma. And this is where the dark reaction is going to take place. Okay, so the dark reaction takes place in the stroma, as we mentioned several times now. The hydrogen moved is moved there by the NADPH, and it's going to be combined with carbon dioxide to produce carbohydrates. So here it is, right? So we have ATP, NADPH being moved over here into the carbon cycle, and you're going to get sugars out. These are the carbohydrates, right, and CO2 in. Okay, so we're just trying to keep it super simple. I know a lot of you may have learned more detail than this in your bio classes in high school and other things, um, but for this, for the purposes of this course, with this course, we'll keep it pretty simple. So I, what I want you to do is just take a second and say, can you identify all the portions of photosynthesis, the light and dark reaction? Hit pause and see if you can do it. Okay, I'm going to take these off. So here you have light coming in, right, hitting the chlorophyll on the, on the thylakoids, right? You have the light reaction that takes place here, NADPH, ATP are pushed over here into the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle, right? And then you have CO2 coming in and sugar out. Here you have water in and oxygen out as this cycles through. Pretty simple. Keep it very simple. Oh, and then just remember, there's an electron transport chain that's happening here. It's converting the ADP right into ATP. Uh, keep that in mind. All right. So when we talk about photosynthesis, we mentioned that we had these things called stomata, right? They're on the underside of the leaf. And these are really just the guard cells. These regulate uh, the amount of CO2 that can be taken into the plant. And they open and close. Um, transpiration, such as like water, can actually go through, can leave out through the stomata. So when the stomata are wide open, you get tons of CO2, but you're going to lose water. When the stomata are closed, you can conserve water, but you're going to limit the amount of photosynthesis you can do because you can't bring in CO2 to break it down and turn it into sugars. So why might higher temperatures lower the rate of photosynthesis? Well, I kind of just gave it to you. Hopefully you understood that, right? But if you can't, think about it for a minute. Why might higher temperatures lower the rate of photosynthesis? OK, so just to repeat a little bit, what's going to happen is when it gets really hot, these are going to close, and you can't bring CO2 in to do photosynthesis. All right, so um, most plants are, are what we call C3 plants. So these are plants. Um, they close their stomata to conserve water when it's hot, and they do really well in kind of moist, cool, very regular uh, environments with normal light conditions. The, this is kind of like, you can think of this as kind of like less machinery. This is a more, less complex form 
of photosynthesis. So 85% of plants are here, things that you eat regularly, like rice, wheat, fruit, etc. they're all here. And then we have C4 plants. So this makes up about 3% of plants. And these guys have an, additional, have an additional enzyme, so like more machinery we were talking about, right? That helps them make sugar when the stomata are almost closed, okay? Uh, and they do really well in areas, of, or at least they can handle areas with high intensity of both light and temperature. So here's some examples of corn, here's some sugar cane, uh, those are C4 plants. So cam plants uh, open their stomata only at night, okay? Um, carbon is stored as an acid, and then during the day, the acid is broken down uh, through photosynthesis to carbon dioxide uh, for its use or in photosynthesis, okay? Uh, sorry, I misspoke there. The acid is broken down into carbon dioxide for the use in photosynthesis during the day, but it's stored as an acid. All right, um, and then this happens in things like succulents. So you think of those plants that are kind of you know, like really thick, like your cactus. You've probably seen or used aloe vera before. Next time you have a pineapple, you can think that's a, that's a cam plant. So there's some examples there. Okay, so just breaking down photosynthesis, you really just need to know what is the purpose of each part of these. Just something very simple. I want you to just have like a schematic understanding of this, but I want you to understand this, this simple schematic pretty well, right? What goes in, what comes out, um, and the products. So kind of coming f full circle, right? Talking about global warming and photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide is is currently being released at faster rates than photosynthesis can remove it. That's one of the biggest issues we have with climate change in the moment, is that if these were balanced, we wouldn't be seeing the temperature changes that we're seeing. And so since we have this extra carbon dioxide, it goes up, it create, you know, uh, mixes with the other greenhouse gases around the earth, <coughs> and that's what causes the temperature change. Deforestation is also a big problem um, in terms of you're clearing the forests that uh, for farming, for human settlement, um, so that individuals can live. And there's no harm in this. People need to live, right? Uh, we need to be able to, uh, to eat and to raise families, that type of thing. Um, but just the hard, cold facts are is that deforestation um, driven by human settlement is responsible for about 25% of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, and this comes from not only cutting, but also burning the forest. So if you think about it, a forest or tree has done, you know, sometimes hundreds of years of photosynthesis and locked up inside of that tree is a ton of CO2 essentially, right? The CO2 has come in, it's been turned into a sugar, it's locked into that tree. So you cut the forest and you burn it and you release all that carbon, all that CO2 back out into the environment. And it's kind of a double whammy when when these when deforestation happens to run cattle because then not only do you knock out a vast forest and, the, and an enormous amount of photosynthesis that's happening, but you're introducing cows which also contribute methane as we talked about a lecture ago. So replanting helps, totally. Young trees have faster net photosynthesis than older trees. So replanting small, strong trees that can grow really quickly is great and uh, and can, can can help with photosynthesis um, but the fact of the matter is uh, even when even our replanting efforts we are much less efficient at getting young trees to grow as humans planting trees than letting nature plant its own trees so there's still some trade-offs there but it's, it's a good thing and we should be doing it um, we've talked about these before the biggest sources of carbon dioxide emissions industry transportation um, commercial, residential, agriculture, uh, these are all major contributors anywhere humans are basically. Um, but each one of us can, can help to reduce our, our footprint. And I talked about this last time a little bit. Um, there's more that we can do. There's some footprint calculators online. You should jump on and do one, do one or two just for fun to figure that out and see how that goes for you to see what your consumption is, see if you can decrease it. Um, and then so students sometimes we go through this pretty quickly and they feel a little unsettled oh my gosh you know respiration and photosynthesis what am I actually supposed to know so there's the diagrams if you fill those out and you feel comfortable with them you'll be okay um, but really you just want to know what are the reactants basically the inputs and what are the products or the outputs of cellular respiration and then you're going to want to know the inputs and outputs in photosynthesis as well and you'll be a-okay um, and uh, and I hope that's helpful so we're going to go ahead and wrap this lecture up right now.
and uh, hopefully things are going well for you guys and your semester is going well and you're staying safe.